started. Also, World War Z. Yeah. I'm the only one without a name tag, so I'll introduce myself first. My name is Chris O'Brien, and I'm the director of sustainability for the university. Um, and I've also been a student and soon will be a faculty member, so I've gotten the whole AU 360. Um, and I've been a member of the Washington, D.C. community for a long time. Um, <coughs> so thanks for coming. Um, Seems we've probably missed some people, maybe due to the weather. Um, so thanks for being here with us, and uh, you know we'll just try to keep this conversation going given the intimacy of the group. Um, but we have a great um, number of guests with us this morning. Um, the, the topic for the conversation is how to integrate sustainability into the curriculum, um, and so I'll you know come right out and say why that's important to me, um, which is that you know, in my role in greening the university, uh, one of the things that I think is probably the highest impact and to me probably the most important thing that the university can do to, to be green is to train students um, to think and act uh, um, to be more sustainable both while they are here at AU but especially as they make career choices. Thank you. Um, because on the one hand, you know, we've got a community of about 15,000 people here, and we have a collective footprint that's, that's sizable. On the other hand, every year we send thousands of people out into the world, um, and if every one of them makes a commitment to make a difference in their career, our, our impact as a university is, has a potential to be far greater, obviously, than just the footprint of the university itself. And when we're dealing with topics like you know, global challenges like climate change, Obviously, you know, I, I feel we have a responsibility as an educational institution um, to make sure that students know what that means um, and that they're equipped with the knowledge and the skills to be able to do something about it, regardless of whatever field of, of practice they choose in their career. Uh, so the way that we have, uh, some of the things that we've done to, to try to act on that mission through our Office of Sustainability is by partnering with various faculty members around campus um, to uh, work together on um, in-class and out-of-class activities, specifically things where there is a um, where there's a curricular interest in a sustainability issue that has uh, a parallel of an activity on campus that, that we face as a challenge of something that we're trying to fix on campus. Um, so we'll just, I'll introduce the, the panelists, um, and then I think, you know, again, given the, the size here, we can just keep this really informal. Um, and try to make this as much as possible about identifying potential opportunities that you might have um, to you know, either collaborate with us or with each other um, or find other ways to work on sustainability issues in the classroom that have practical applications on the campus. So um, from the right to the left, we've got Kiho Kim. Um, and well, one of, I don't know if you all know each other, Simon Nicholson, Vicki Kieschel. Why don't you just introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about um, what you what your, you know, what your faculty role is yeah. before we get into the <coughs> presentations. And can we continue on and have everybody accept yeah, yeah, absolutely. Vicki, do you want to speak? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm Vicki Kieschel. Um, I'm the Global Environmental Politics Program as assignment uh, with an SIS. I'm an architect. Um, I'm also a faculty member at the Center for Climate Change and Environmental Justice. And I've been a faculty member at Hopper Shaw. So um, I teach variety of courses, but sustainable design lead is one, which is a kind of combination of skill sets, kind of project oriented, that talks about sustainability, who's, who's kind of been part of the purpose of our work. And also, of course, for undergrads and sustainable students, we'll also do campus theme or near campus theme projects, which I can talk about later. Simon? Yes, I'm, I'm Simon Nicholson. I'm with Vicki in the Global Environmental Politics Program. I'm also one of the directors of the Global Scholars Program, which is a three-year degree track in science for honor students. Um, I teach courses in, at the undergraduate level, environmental politics with that. We have a gateway course um, that I'll talk some about. Um, at the master's level, I teach courses in um, things like transitions to a post-carbon economy. Um, and there's been some work that I've done with Chris's office around that theme that I'll, I'll speak some about too. Um, and my research is in blue politics and questions about emerging technologies. My name is Keir Kim. I'm in the Department of Environmental Science, and I'm a marine ecologist by training. So I do a lot of research on coral reefs, 
Um, in terms of my teaching, I've spanned the gamut. I've taught 15 different classes <laughs> at AU in my 13 years, uh, including uh, Sustainable Earth, which is an introductory environmental science class, all the way up to my conservation for graduate students uh, in my program. Uh, but one of the things I've been doing is incorporating the idea of research into sustainability issues, which we'll, uh, I will talk about a little bit. I'm Emily Curley. I work in the Office of Sustainability with Chris and Josh. I'm a recent graduate of the Global Environmental Policy Program as of May. Um, so like Chris, I'm kind of on both sides, staff and student. Um, worked with at least a few of you in the room giving tours or working with classes. So hope to jump in as it warrants. Oh, uh, my name is Vanya. I'm just a session facilitator. Here. Just what? Session facilitator. Oh. Uh, I'm going to be absolutely open and honest. Uh, when I saw the word sustainability, I thought I'd be here talking about how to make classroom work sustainable. <laughs> so the students <laughs> really remember and know what, what they're doing. Uh, but having, having said that, um, I'm an old uh, aid officer of 35 years, U.S. Foreign Aid, and I'm teaching a course called Rethinking U.S. Foreign Aid. And uh, one of the new classes that I will be teaching this year is President Obama's new uh, Global Climate Initiative. And I'm going to have to meet with all of you <laughs> to learn uh, about it and what I can actually teach. So I'm here in the right place for the wrong reason. meeting. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Joshua Kaplan. Um, I work in the Office of Sustainability with Chris and Emily. Um, I'm also an AU grad. I did my introductory degree in environmental studies here, graduated in 2011. I'm currently doing my master's in co grad School of Business in Sustainability Management. I've had every single one of the panelists as professor at some point <laughs> uh, in my career here. Um, we've also worked uh, worked with them. Um, so, like Emily said, I've kind of been on both sides of the fence um, in terms of working with classes on projects, but also being in those classes um, and having kind of university as a So, how would you rank us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not brave enough. <laughs> Still getting through. <laughs> 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 you gave me that grade, right? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Andrew Klein. Uh, I'm an adjunct teaching uh, public private partnerships. And last semester, uh, I included one day on one class. My class meets three and a half hours um, in the evenings. One day on corporate sustainability and uh, tried to draw the connection between corporate sustainability and public private partnerships and was a little bit concerned that someone was going to look at my syllabus and say this doesn't fit neatly enough, but no one said anything. And the students were really into it, so I've actually incorporated two day, two classes this semester on corporate sustainability um, and try to link it to public private partnerships as much as I can. This is in the uh, No, this is in the School of Public Affairs. Okay. Okay. I'm Sean Bates. I'm a lawyer by training, but teaching international organizations and cross-cultural communication. I can explain that if there's time. Um, and have taken classes with Vicki and been very happy with, with learning from her. And I've hung out far too much on time. So <laughs> I'm very happy to be here and learning more about how I can bring some sustainability both into the international organizations class, where we do talk about environment and environmental organizations and climate change how international institutions are dealing with that. But also, I'm really intrigued about how I might be able to bring it more to the cross-cultural course and talking about different attitudes towards the environment. I'm Heather Heckel. I teach with the Washington Semester Program. And my course is called International Environment and Development, but it's actually a sustainability development class. This is my fifth year teaching it. And our courses are guest speaker based and organizational based. And I actually go to Costa Rica. You and I have chatted by email several times. It's nice to finally meet you. Um, and we go to Costa Rica for two and a half weeks as a case study. So I'm really interested in learning how to integrate this into other courses as I move on into other things in the future. Great. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Ed Stasek, faculty in the Department of Public Administration and Policy. Uh, I teach classes primarily in the 
utilization theory of behavior in public management. Uh, that may seem strange down here, but I actually uh, am engaged in some research with some colleagues on uh, social equity and sustainability. Mm -hmm. My name is Don Vivian. I'm a first year PhD student in the School of Communication. My research uh, kind of centers around attitudes and thinking around the science and technology mm -hmm. environment. So I'm really interested to see how sustainability issues are. Um, you know, brought to the classroom, kind of understanding uh, how that even community uh, is achieving the goals that they set. Thank you so much for your service session. Great. Thank you. Uh, my, my graduate degree is in science and technology and society. So, yeah, similar. And I should mention that um, the, the courses that I'll be teaching in the spring, one is the practicum that um, Simon and I co, co developed in SIS, um, where we'll be studying uh, the carbon offset project. In Costa Rica that AU sources carbon offsets from. Um, and the other is in CODOD uh, and it's called Sustainable Products and Purchasing. It's about green supply chain. Um, so why don't we, um, I think we had agreed that we'd go Kiko, the key sign. Uh, it still works. Why don't we go ahead? Okay. So um, the, the, the main reason that I engage in sustainability issue uh, is to bring something that is particularly relevant to my students as they really grapple with the idea of the scientific research process. So as a science, uh, scientist, I want to uh, make sure that my students understand what it means to do to, to research, which is actually a lot simpler than it looks like, and then um, pick a topic which would also engage them uh, as it applies to their own lives and something that is relevant on campus as well. And so those, those two things come together uh, in these sustainability uh, research projects that I get my students to work on. It, it began a long time ago, uh, and I'll describe some of the things that, that I did, but I also want for faculty to think about the mechanics of doing this on campus, and I've done this for a number of years, and so I come up with three different ways you can incorporate it into a classroom setting. Now, one is to teach a one credit hour topics class, uh, and, and I, I use that platform to work on the trayless dining program that I worked on a number of years ago, and I'll explain that in a little bit. The second way is to uh, teach it as part of the university college program. And I'll plug the university college program as something that you should think about. It is a, uh, um, they have a year-long program where the students are learning and living together on campus and they have the second semester of their freshman year to carry out a team project. And for that, you can throw out a, a, pr a project for them to work on. This is, that's the university college program. Uh, the third is to simply incorporate into a senior capstones class. Uh, for our program, we don't have individual students carrying out projects. Uh, the senior capstone in, uh, incorporates a team-based project. And so uh, those are the three platforms that I've used. The one credit topic class, a number of years ago, I was approached by somebody who was working at the time for Bon Appetit, who tried to remove trays from the TDR. Now, at that point, the, the, uh, in, the industry said, you know, if you get rid of trays, the students will uh, waste less food. And so working for Bon Appetit, they thought that was a great idea, so they just simply moved the trays. And the students were not very happy. They lost their mode of transportation when it snowed. Uh, they felt <laughs> like this was something that they paid for and they should be able to use a tray and eat as much as they want because they were the customers. And so they had to bring the trays back. Uh, the manager thought that was a great idea to get the students involved in the process of transforming the TDR and getting the trays out. Uh, somehow we got a hold of my name, and so um, I said, oh, you know what, maybe I should do this as a one credit hour class. And so I built the idea of uh, how do we get the trace out of the TDR. And so I got the students thinking about what's what's been done. Uh, it turned out that the study that the manager was relying on was an industry study and, and was not peer reviewed. They didn't provide any data. They simply said that removing trays reduces food waste by 30%. And that was it. I had contacted them, they didn't respond. And so I thought this is a great opportunity to do research. And so uh, having the assistance of the manager, we had the students design an experiment where they would randomly remove trays from TDR and measure how much food was coming back at the, the waste station. Uh, so we randomized the dates on which the trays would be removed with the help of an tea. Uh, we did a lot of PR work as well. We had the students in the cafeteria saying, look, we're going to be doing this study. And so, were you part of this, Josh? I was. Right. So, and so, uh, we, we did all of the PR work. We actually engaged somebody in SOC to do additional PR work. And so, uh, over a month and a half period, students 
like Josh, waited for <laughs> other students to bring back their food trays and scraped off food, waited and everything. And uh, it turned out that if you remove trays, uh, you reduce food waste by about 38%. Huge amounts. And so uh, those data were published everywhere. Fox News came in and did a little segment on us. Uh, and the following semester, the trays were removed and very few people actually complained. Because once they saw that their peers and their colleagues were involved in, in this research and it was being done by the students, not the big man taking away their trays, they were less combative about the whole process. And so that was sort of the, the light bulb that was going off in my head. Because before that, I didn't do a lot of sustainability stuff. I was working at Coral, thought, would I be doing this? Um, <coughs> so that sort of excited me as a way of teaching more than anything else teaching research. And then um, for, for the University College, I carried on this theme. And so with the help of Emily and, and, and Chris, and in fact, I, I give them almost all of the credit uh, through various classes, including the senior capstones. Now I knock on the door, call them up and say, hey, what projects do you want us to carry out? And so they would help me establish all of the criteria. Emily was particularly uh, important in this past senior capstones class, where we did lease certification of four buildings, the quadplex. Uh, the Gray Hall, the Cave Hall, and two other halls I don't remember the names of. Clark. And what was it? Clark and Roper. Clark and Roper. Uh, Roper. And so uh, Emily was very instrumental. She helped me define parameters and work with the students. Uh, and so it was very, very easy on my part uh, to get students involved in getting that lead certification. From my undergraduate class with University College, they did a stormwater management plan again with Emily. Uh, where they mapped out the entire campus and its contribution to the stormwater issue in D.C. And, and, and uh, that report was provided to Chris, and I think that gave us some uh, um, ideas about how to reduce stormwater uh, inputs on campus. And so, in fact, one of the crazy ideas that Emily and I are plotting out is to create a wetland uh, right in front of Beakley Hall for this coming fall. Dig a hole while nobody's looking and plant some trees <laughs> and, uh, and plants and, and, and reduce our, our stormwater footprint for this coming fall for my UC class. And, and then the quad flex was the senior captain's class. And the reason why I think it's important for the students is that now, now they have something that they can write about when they apply for jobs and internships. They have this very finite thing that they were involved in. They were engaged in research. And in some cases, some of the stuff is publishable. The trailer study uh, was published about a year and a half ago uh, in, in a refereed journal. And so now we have, in the literature, some documented evidence of the reduction in food waste um, by removing the trees, as opposed to an interesting uh, study. So, so I, I bring sustainability as a way of teaching research, uh, uh, defining methods, the parameters, the questions, and the writing up of those uh, results and communicating them in a way that people buy into the work that you've done. And I'll stop there. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm tempted to start jumping into a whole bunch of things you said, but we should probably just move along. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, th there are a lot of reasons to do this. I mean, for me, the big three years, there's the pedagogical reason that Pierre was sort of talking about. Um, there's the uh, <coughs> campus community responsibility idea that Chris was talking about, and then there's a third one for me, which is just the fun of it, which if you're an instructor is really key. Um, it really does keep teaching fresh. So with the pedagogical, uh, going and kind of ripping off of what you, know, you were saying, I mean, a lot of what, um, in, and I'll talk in a minute about some of the projects we do in my courses, but um, if you're really thinking about what is entrepreneurial and what is entrepreneurship and how people will tackle it, a lot of it has to do with this idea of observation and how you how you kind of develop your skills in observation, looking at what is out there, what's going on, what is the need, and how do you address it. And when you think about that, a lot of certainly I think the projects that we're talking about today are um, right on the campus um, and geared towards kind of bringing that out of students. Um, and it's a skill, I think, that if learned and applied will transform a little world. Um, it also is a great way to connect theory to practice. 
And if they're reading about climate change and then they're applying these skills uh, that they're learning or they're, they're working in a hands-on way on a problem, they're saying, oh, I can make that bridge. Very important. And then the, the third big pedagogical reason for me to do this is that they practice collaboration, which um, is increasingly, I think, the way things get done. Um, so in terms of the community values of ABA, a great thing that they see is they get very plugged into the university, especially, I'd say, the undergrads um, that, that do this. By taking on these campus projects, they're, they're very invested. And they're very proud of it. Uh, it's just a great, a great thing that happens as a result of this. And then that also kind of bolsters AU's identity. Uh, the American dream is great. I mean, you know, people are really, really proud of that. Um, and then the fun thing I mentioned a lot. Um, so what if I taught here? Uh, I teach these courses I mentioned in sustainable design. And we, we've had a variety of projects we've done over the years. I, this will be, <coughs> I've taught this now for five years. Um, so um, we've done things along the lines of what Keo's done. I mean, one semester, my grad students were doing the same thing your undergrads right. were doing, measuring the kind of water fixture stuff. That's a great skill to have, particularly if you are going out. And again, they like the idea they can mention this on the resume and say, hey, I helped you. They always get to answer the question. Very important. Uh, they've done things like they drafted a commuting survey how would you understand uh, how students commute by public transport? And who would, you, um, who would you go to to try to survey and what would the survey look like? They've done sustainable sites analyses and, um, of campus. Um, last year, uh, they did just, I thought, a great job on campus bicycle <coughs> or campus patron list. Again, Emily made that connection from the United Strata of um, the Arkansas School. And then um, my grad students this past term took on a sort of a preliminary assessment of what the East Campus project that is going on here. Uh, in sustainable cities, we've done things that are on a more urban level next to campus. One thing that we did one semester was we said, what if AU, we learned that the National Park Service was seeding control Franklin Square Park downtown to the downtown business improvement district. So what would happen if AU co-opted Ford Circuit. How could you redesign that sustainably? But also so that it was AU branded. And then became an amenity for us. Uh, we did the same one semester with the Naval Security Station, Homeland Security, back in the day, about three or four years ago, when they really were going to move to St. Elizabeth's and vacate that. Um, so I, I just the other things about uh, this that has been great on campus is we have the SIS building. The SIS building is truly, in terms of if you want to teach sustainability and a lot of kind of practices, you want to look at a real world embodied example of that in the built environment level, it is truly the gift that keeps on giving. I use it frequently, we tour the building every semester. Great best practice right here. I had a student, Andrew, who one year did a study of, well, it's, it's the SIS building is living up to its new promise of energy. Yeah, it was. We did the research. That was great. Prove that. Um, the bike plan project, again, you know, this was something where it was really interesting. I think one of the major uh, findings of, of the bike plan project was really this is something that for the campus, we're not talking about biking through the campus. We're not UC Davis. We're not a new campus. We're talking about commuter biking to the and so that was a focus that was really tied to our local community level. Again, a great lesson in sustainability and made recommendations there. And finally, I guess the lessons learned from all of this, just to wrap up my little spiel. Um, well, the East Campus I won't talk about, but there was there was some, were some great things that came out of their ruminations about that, including their very eloquent statement of what AU's community identity should be or is. Um, and uh, I can read that if you're interested, but I, I want to make sure you ask. Um, I think the lessons learned from my end is that students are eager to transcend the classroom. They are really eager to transcend the classroom. They're initially wary of what I kind of teach. Yeah, I'm an architect, so I'm teaching design. They're a little wary.
very about it. It's like people laughing, just like thinking. But they come around and they really do end up believing that some of these skills stretch them in ways that they have an advantage in the um, The undergrad students are really a great fit for campus projects. That's a good too. The grad students are so excellent, here, as are the undergrads. I mean, you know, Emily's a prime example of excellent grad students um, that hopefully are bound to the university. <laughs> um, but they also want, the grad students, I think, it, the projects on campus have to be special for them. They want to get away and kind of do this ultra foreign or else, you know, we did the National Capital Planning Commission was here um, last year. The bike plan was something that engaged them, but yeah. Um, and then, the, so the impacts on them uh, are basically it's wonderful to see. A number of them, of course, they come in prime to go into this field anyway. But a number of my undergrads have come out and gone right into the field too. I mean, whether, well, Josh, you were kind of prime to go into the field here anymore, so you're now one of these grad students. But I have undergrads who are now working in the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, in the Institute for Market Transformation, which is one of the great kind of local transformative organizations. They're working in the district department of the environment, green roofs, all these great, great local green institutions. And a handful have gone on to urban design school. Yeah. Uh, impacts on me, continuous learning, personal growth, keeping teaching fresh. So Kehoe gave us three ways to start integrating sustainability uh, projects into, into teaching. I'll give you a couple more. Um, I think one of the most straightforward things to do is just to integrate sustainability exercises into existing classes. And I've done a great deal of that during my time here. I'll give some examples. Um, and another thing you can do is design an entirely new platform for delivery of these courses. And in fact, Kehoe and I did this a few years ago. Um, and so I'll talk about a course that we developed with a colleague of ours from the School of Communications that had us take students to the Galapagos Islands for sustainability. Yeah. Um, the reason that I have been doing this for a long time, trying to integrate sustainability exercises into the classroom, is because the environmental challenge is about the biggest deal that we face at the moment. Um, and for students to grasp that and to work out practical ways to deal with it, um, they need to get their hands in. Uh, and so the way I, I typically begin a class that has some sort of sustainability project integrated into it is I say to the students, if we can't do it here, then we're dreaming. Forget about it. You can't imagine you can go out into the world and make a big difference. But with all of the resources and energy and brain power that we have on this campus, if we can't take care of our problems here, there's no way we can imagine going out into the world and doing something effective. Um, and so what I try to do is treat the campus as a laboratory. Um, and the main the thing that I'm trying to help students grasp is that these problems, challenges that seem very abstract, actually have concrete expression in our everyday lives and in our everyday actions on something like university campus. Um, and so when you think about environmental challenges, they're abstract in at least two ways. They're abstract conceptually. How do you help students understand a problem like climate change, which is about an invisible gas getting into an invisible atmosphere, affecting distant people in distant generations most profoundly? And how do you get people to start to, to grapple with that? Um, well, by seeing energy systems and resource flows and environmental impacts in their everyday experience. That's the way you start cutting through the abstraction. Um, and environmental problems are abstract in terms of how we respond to them. Um, because in, in the courses that we teach in the School of International Service, what typically happens is that we talk about big international mechanisms of response to a challenge like climate change. Let's look at the United Nations sponsored meetings um, under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, what's going on, and how do students possibly connect with that? Um, and so we have to think about political action in a different way for our students. <clears throat> what does political action start to look like? It's about thinking about institutional constraints and our university campuses and institution. How do you start bringing people together to make a difference um, given the set of constraints and, and so forth that we face on our campus? And so this becomes a laboratory. What does effective political action really look like? <clears throat> um, and I completely agree with you that 
you've got to make it fun, and the way to make it fun for students is to get them doing something that they feel like they're making some sort of difference in their own lives and the lives of those around them. Um, so I'll, I'll give you some examples and then kind of circle back to those um, broader themes. <coughs> the, the first way that I started to try and integrate sustainability exercises into classroom teaching was through a course that I taught for a number of years at the undergraduate level called International Environmental Politics. One of these big picture, broad theme courses about international institutions and how things fit together. Um, one semester I just thought, you know, this, this was before Chris's office was uh, formed and formalized. Um, there are all these interesting things happening on the campus that the students just don't know about. So how can I integrate them with the, the great sustainability efforts that we're, that we're currently undertaking? Um, so I just made an optional assignment for the students and I put it on the syllabus. Um, if you want to, you can get into a group and you can identify some sort of challenge that we face on the campus around resource flows or sustainability issues um, and then do something about it in a semester. That was it. That was the assignment. And a couple of groups formed. A couple of groups, a couple of groups of students said, well, we should, we should tackle something. Um, in fact, I made it either on campus or off campus. It's reached into our local community as well. Um, and so in that first semester, <coughs> we had one group that took on um, composting in the Davenport coffee lounge which hadn't been kind of thought about at that point. And we had another group that took on um, the development of a community garden for a local um, elderly person's um, uh, retirement home. Um, and so I had these, these great, really focused, energetic students who got together, they went off campus, they identified a problem, um, and they worked to put something in place um, that made a difference in the lives of a, of a, a good number of people. Um, and the Davenport composting initiative has led to other sorts of things that have been really profoundly important on campus. Um, and I've, I've kind of kept a list of, over the, over the years, what other sorts of projects students have, have just come up with themselves. The double-sided printing in the library, um, food options in the terrace dining room, um, the Take Back the Tap initiative. Lots of students get involved with that each year to try and ban bottled water. That never goes anywhere <laughs> on campus. But um, lots of students want to take that on this semester. Um, and on and on and on. There are all these projects that students have identified and tried to do something about. Uh, now that Chris's office has been formed, um, Josh and Emily have a fat folder filled with project ideas. And so each semester, most more recently, when I've taught this course, I've just sent students down there. If you want to do something? Go and find out what's currently being done and, and what these folks uh, think needs to be done. Um, what we've learned out of all these different exercises, I think, is that even when students fail dismally to, to achieve what they set out to achieve at the start of the semester, they learn a huge amount. Um, they learn that taking political action isn't just about you know, waving a sign <coughs> or uh, <coughs> imagining that change will happen without action. Um, it's, it's, it's doing the, the kind of basic grassroots political stuff that's required to move an institution in a different direction. So they've got, they've got to imagine what the future's going to look like. What are, what are the results you want from your problem? They've got to work out what are the coalitions on campus that we need to bring together to take action. They need to work out what's already been done, what's possible, and on and on and on. Um, another thing, another avenue has been um, this, this co-teaching that I've done with uh, Kiho and others. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we sat down together and said, we, we want to go to the Galapagos Islands. Wouldn't that be a great thing to do? Uh, how can we build a course that allows us to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite the... So it was kind of that way. Very, <laughs> very mercenary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so Kiho and I got together with Larry Engel from the School of Communications, um, and we proposed between our three different teaching units a course um, called the Practice of Sustainability, Environmentalism, Practice of Environmentalism, yeah. Practice of Environmentalism, um, that brought together students from our three units: filmmaking, political studies, uh, environmental science, um, and had them try to understand and grapple with the challenges of the global design. Um, and then we, we spent a semester doing that, and then we took them away for a couple of weeks over the summer um, where they conducted research of various types on the Galapagos Islands, and we did this over three different years. Um, and all kinds of extraordinary um, projects were put together out of that, um, out of that course. Uh, many of them still exist on the web today as, as films and, and websites. Uh, and again, the students learned a hell of a lot. Um, and for me, that was the most I've ever learned as faculty member, getting to work with colleagues um, with vibrant students doing something really hands-on and practical. Um, the final thing I'll just mention very briefly, and then you can probably pick up on this too, Chris, is this um, carbon offsets project. 
Um, when you think about campus sustainability, there's a lot going on, and Chris's office is now the hub for all the sustainability efforts on the campus. We've got all the stuff that's happening with um, facilities and retrofitting buildings. We've got all the stuff happening with um, energy and resource flows. Um, but the, the curriculum is really the untapped area. And I, I completely agree um, that if we're going to make a real difference as an institution, we need to start working out what it means to integrate these sorts of projects into our um, curriculum. Um, one obvious way to do that is to take on something that the university cares about um, and to make it a direct um, project uh, within a class. I did that last year for a master's course um, on transitions to a post-carbon future. Let's look big picture of what it means to move societies in a different direction. Um, now let's kind of pull back and say, what does it mean to take an institution like AU and take it to the next level? And so I had groups of students tackle all kinds of different projects um, for Chris's office. Um, one of the things we looked at was this new carbon offsets project, which is basically um, buy into a, an avoided deforestation project in Costa Rica um, to try and offset the carbon emissions attached to um, particularly our study abroad, but also other university um, travel. Um, we don't know whether that's a good idea. Uh, but Chris and I went down to Costa Rica and we identified this project, and Chris, doing lots of hard lobbying work on the campus, convinced the university to buy into it. Um, now we want to see if we're doing the right thing. Um, and so my students last semester laid some groundwork for that. They said, what's best practice in terms of carbon offset projects, um, how do we start to understand what we're trying to achieve and how do we measure outcomes. So they've given us a framework for analysis now. Um, this semester, Chris is going to lead a practicum course, um, which is a small group of graduating master students in SIS. This is their final kind of capstone project. Um, they will go down to Costa Rica and do rapid um, assessment um, of the environmental and social impacts of our investment in this avoided deforestation project. And so this is extraordinarily relevant to the long-term careers of these students. They're learning a set of skills which will be valuable to them moving forward, gives incredibly valuable information to the university, um, and ideally will provide best practice for other institutions are looking to go down this route. Um, and so such a, a simple exercise like this can, can have very profound impacts, we hope, um, beyond uh, the environment of campus. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Assuming, uh, taking the position of an outsider, there are three terms that you use, which everyone has, that I, I need to understand the linkage amongst them. The word sustainability, the word climate, and the word environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I see them, at least I see them, as kind of different things, but you see them apparently all linked. Could you explain, at least the way this program is linking them, what, what is the link? I can define each one, but I don't, I don't understand the link. Yeah. Well, I, I, should, I should, should we design a course on, on that? <laughs> <laughs> and I think we could probably all answer that differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly, it, it, there is not an agreed, simple definition on each of those, unless anyone wants to give, give their version right now. Um, but so, so the confusion, is, is, I think, is just part of the challenge of working in this area is that people, that the language is not shared yet. Um, so when I say sustainability, I mean social responsibility, environmental costs and benefits, and financial costs and benefits. And, but to me, those are concentric circles. A lot of people use the three-legged school analogy, talk about social, environmental, and economic all being part of sustainability. I actually see them more as concentric circles that the planet is what we've all got and humans live within that, so we're part of the planet and humans happen to use money to do a lot of things for our, our, our benefit or to our detriment. So money is a tool that humans use, humans live within the environment. So ultimately when I, when I say sustainability, I'm just talking about a flourishing earth, including all life on that planet, which includes a species called human beings. And one of the ways that human beings tend to get things done is by agreeing on the value of a piece of paper. <laughs> to, to me, all three of those need to be improving for something to be sustainable. But I, I'd like to, so I, I stole the answer from, from the panel, but I'd like to just take a couple minutes to summarize some of the themes here, um, and then I'm going to hand out a list of project ideas that, um, that can sign to mention that we have you know, lots of ideas that are up projects that our office can work with people on. I'll hand out that list and I'll also hand out um, an application for funding. If 
you're interested in actually doing something on campus, we can provide a small amount um, of funding toward that goal. Um, so some of the things that I heard um, that are certainly reflected in my experience is there are lots of different ways of integrating sustainability into, class, into the classroom, um, from you know, integrating exercises and um, perspectives into an existing class. Um, and we've, we, we do an annual survey of uh, asking faculty to tell us to self-identify, and, and we don't give them the definition of sustainability, but we say, tell us in your own definition whether your course is sustainability related. Um, and we also ask them to tell us, to, to self-identify whether their research is sustainability related. And we get answers um, that faculty teaching courses as varied as Arabic language, dance, to the more obvious ones like environmental studies, um, but the point being that integrating sustainability into curriculum doesn't necessarily mean an environmental science class only or a sustainable development class only. It really, from what we get reported to us, people are doing it in every discipline. Um, there are, um, there's a university college which I think is a great, I mean, the way that you would use the university college to design a whole year-long program, if anyone can try to replicate something like that, I think that's fantastic. Um, there's the senior capstone or the practicum on the graduate level. Um, there's uh, providing, you know, what Vicky does is provide a, a course framework that produces a professional accreditation at the end of the course, because the students take a, a, not just a test for the class, but they end up taking a test with a third party to earn a, you know, a comma lead AP or comma lead associate after their name. So talk about really becoming equipped for you know, a professional career. Um, that's a great way of integrating sustainability into a class. Um, I see a few different trends that are leading more toward this kind of um, classroom-based, you know, campus-based application of classroom study um, across higher ed that are leading towards this. One is that what I think is an increasing um, focus on embracing interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, I'd be curious to hear if you feel that that message is, is increasingly the case here at AU or not. I, I only see what I want to see, I guess, so I see that happening all the time. Um, but the other um, trend that I think this kind of collaboration reflects is the increasing desire on the part of students to, to do just that, to apply uh, what they learn, you know, the concepts that they learn in the classroom, um, especially because when they're going to be, let's face it, saddled with, a, with debt for a long time, um, whether we like it or not, um, the study of knowledge for knowledge's own sake is, is framed by the reality that you're going to have to admit few people can afford to study for its own sake. People have to get a job after they leave college. Um, so to be able to take the, the pure form of knowledge and um, be able to prepare students in a way that allows them to use that knowledge in a way that's going to pay the bills um, is something that I think students increasingly um, that we hear from students. A few things that I would mention as, um, as needs or if you're considering uh, developing a campus-based project in, in, you know, in parallel with a class, a few things that I think came out in all the different projects that we heard about. First, starting with good information, and that's really the core of the, of the curriculum itself. For giving students, the, the, the TDR trade study was a perfect example of that. Um, the industry knew that they were going to get, um, that they were going to save money and save and reduce food waste. That was based on some data. Um, <coughs> Secondly, is having the practical skills, which increasingly include collaboration, which also came up, I think, in all three of the discussions, to be able to apply that knowledge. And third is having policy or social marketing, basically the, you know, the political skills related to, you, know, you need the practical skills, but you also need the political skills to be able to get things done. And that's where this collaborative, um, or you know, we, we often, uh, refer to a guy who wrote a book called Community-Based Social Marketing, um, Doug Mackenzie Moore. We use his book as a Bible. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but it, it's, it's a great how-to. Um, taking, you know, a student, yeah, and we heard this too, students learn in a classroom what the world should be. And they, they basically, they learn, okay, here are the global trends that, that, that we're living in. Major decline in every, the rapid decline in every major ecosystem. Okay, so we should be doing the following to fix that. And then sometimes we hear students on campus saying, the university should be doing this, that, or the other thing. But there's a chasm between what's happening and what students think should be happening that has to be bridged by practical skills and social skills um, to be able to get things done. That's really well said. <laughs> um, so that, to me, is really the purpose of this kind of collaboration. Um, um, the, some of the lessons or, or, or benefits to me of, of these kinds of projects. Um, doing something as a class project and failing, it, it, you know, a real world project at the campus level and failing dismally, we're better to fail than somewhere where the consequences are, you know, you, you still learn and as long as you you know, as long as academically you were rigorous, you'll get a good grade. Whether the project succeeded in the practical application or not, you 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 learned from that too. So it was a small failure. You know, all things um, considered, it's a pretty safe way to fail. So it, you know, it, it allows for experimentation and innovation, uh, which requires trying things that you don't know whether will succeed or not. Um, it builds. I, I really loved how. Um, Vicky commented on how students get bought in through that. And there's the transition from learning in the classroom to then becoming responsible for the outcome of an actual project builds buy-in in a way that if you're worried whether they're going to do the reading or not, um, I bet when when the project product is something that their name is on that may have resulted in something physically changing on campus, I would probably be a little more likely to do the reading myself because I know the outcome is, yeah, it's still a small safe failure, but it's a failure nonetheless and I'd rather succeed. So I think it's going to build the kind of buy-in that you want a student to have to, just to be engaged in, in the subject matter. Um, obviously, we've, we've heard numerous times that a major benefit of this is that they're, they're better equipped for entering the job market, whatever their field is. They learn practical, uh, they had a practical experience that hopefully prepare them for a real world job. Um, and, it, and on that same note, it builds their network. In many cases, um, it, these projects are, are, you know, we're part of that network that's being built, you know, our office. But in many cases, we're only one partner in a campus project. There are lots of other people that students interact with through these projects, whether it's government officials, um, uh, corporations that, that work with AU, that we work with, that we get students to interact with like Mon Appetit, um, carbon offset um, suppliers like we're working with in Costa Rica. Those are all networking opportunities that those students are going to be able to leverage potentially into internships or fellowships or, or jobs. A couple of challenges and then I'll pass out the, the project list. Um, as you look at this project list or as, you, as we have a little bit of time to explore project ideas that you might have, one of the challenges that we face every, almost every time that we work on a project like this with a group of um, students in a class is the reality that they're not professionals yet. Um, so their skills and knowledge and abilities are not really, you know, we're not, we're thinking about this as we have a problem to solve. We could hire a contractor or we could work with students. Um, and. So our expectations sometimes are, you know, I, I'm the boss, you're my employee, I'm like, you can, you can do this. But the reality is clients, and not just us, other third-party clients, if you partner your students with any other third-party out, you know, external client, try to make sure that you manage the expectation of that client that either define the project so well that that the chances of success are really high because the, the scope is narrow and well-defined, or make sure that the client knows that from your perspective, first and foremost, the most important thing in this collaboration is that the students learn something, not necessarily that the client gets a professional product because they're not paying for it. So you know, be clear that they 
might not get um, something of the quality that they're able to implement on. Um, the other challenge I think that, uh, that projects like this face is something that Simon talked a lot about, which is this is a challenge and an opportunity, which is that <laughs> making the abstract real, students aren't necessarily always prepared for, for that reality. They, 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 might, they might think they know well, this is the solution and this is the way the world should be. And why isn't it that way? But if they bring that attitude to a client, the client is going to be a, probably a little bit more based in you know, practical, next week I need to get something done. And, work, and you know, the reality is here, your proposal is there. There's no way in hell that that's going to get implemented. So you got to bring it to a point where we can actually feasibly implement something, not just you know, not just um, talk about the way the world should be, but talk about you know, give me recommendations that I can actually implement. Um, and that chasm, I think, is one of the really steep for for some students. And this is not across the board at, at all. But for some students, that's a really difficult um, barrier to, to overcome because they're just they are so grounded in, in the knowledge of the facts that it's difficult to swallow that you're going to have to face compromises in the real world. Um, and Can I add to that? For, so I think it's really important as an instructor to really manage the expectations of the students. And you know, often they see facts, but they don't really see all of the work that went to build that fact. And this is particularly the case in science where you see a paper, you see a wonderful result, but it doesn't really show the three or four years of research that went into this two-page paper. I mean, if you think about Watson and Crick's paper on DNA, it's about half page long. And they don't really understand the years of work by lots of people that went into it. And, and so, and most of that work is really, really boring and dull. And it's painstaking. And the research, so even the food scraping thing, lots of stuff is really dull to do. Uh, the lead certification isn't all that exciting. Measuring the length of a carpet, that's not that exciting. But so, uh, by managing expectations, letting them know what goes into these sorts of things on a lead certification phase looks great, but the work that went into all of that is can be very mundane. The exciting part is just a, a small part of the overall work effort, uh, but they should be ready for it and, and understand that you have to do the hard work before you get sort of this prize at the end of the process. It's uh, critically important for the teacher to help them make those connections. Right. Otherwise, they miss the point. Yeah, they're going, well, why am I measuring carpets for? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so if, you take, if you take that, what Kiho said, and also thinking about managing student expectations, um, one thing that I often find with students who are working in groups on our campus is that the first time they had a roadblock, they throw up their hands. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to say, you can only push people to do what's feasible in the political setting in which you're working. Um, but at the same time, the environmental situation demands that we do things that currently are not politically feasible. We have to do. We have to make our campus do stuff that the campus is not currently willing to do. Um, and you know, so, so there's this, there's this kind of interplay. There's this kind of strange thing going on with the student expectations. You've got to keep pushing to go beyond the roadblock that you're currently facing. You can't throw up your hands, but at the same time you can't try and put the thing so far down the road that nobody's going to follow you. Now, so that's that's what political activism and action ultimately demands of the students. Well said. Uh, so, so let me pass around this list that uh, this is uh, an informal list um, of potential student project ideas, um, and I'll just uh, end it out with with a, um, a quote from Joel Swinton, who uh, a few years ago gave my, my brother was a student activist at the University of Houston, and he earned a, an award that was given to him in person by President Clinton, um, and President Clinton uh, said at that time. It's, it's not a question of if, but how. So that that's what this list is all about. Is you know, we know we need to do these things. The question is how do we get them done. So my hope is that um, you all have some ideas about that and we'll be able to work with you and, and your students. Um, and I'll, I'll pass this around as well. I think I I only have a few copies. So uh, well, if, if you think that you'll apply for some funding. Um, and the, the funding available is between $500 and $1,500 for a, a project. Um, just let me know and I'll give you an application. I'll point to where it is on our website. So I think at this point we could just um, go around the room and 
if people have questions about uh, potential projects for working with us, and, and by no means do I mean to limit this to projects with us or even projects on campus, um, but more just the idea of sustainability related um, enhancements in curriculum, whether it's a campus project or a, or a local, regional, or global project. Um, there, there are probably different ways that we can support that, um, regardless of what the specific topic is or what the scope is. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I, I always find these things exciting, and I learn so much from everybody. And that's actually what I wanted to mention. It's a little bit different from the project list on campus, although I, I think it's wonderful to have that. Um, I'm interested in, in what Simon said, which is um, that the curriculum piece is a little bit missing. Um, and then also, I, I think you said that this is the single biggest deal. Um, if this is the biggest issue facing our time, which is what I happen to believe, um, there aren't very many people in this room. And so I'm really interested in the question of how do we get more people on campus to be excited about this in whatever way is relevant to their lives or their curriculum. And so I kind of wish that on this list was the challenge of getting more faculty engaged through their syllabi, through their own volunteer experiences, or whatever. Um, and I'd love to hear what your plans are or what you're currently doing to share these success stories because let me be honest, I sort of stalk these folks in these meetings because I'm in Washington semester and we're very tangential to the campus and, and I know that. But I, I'm inspired by this and I'd love to know how to learn more and I'd love for other people to be learning more. Um, so I too have taught in the Galapagos and I teach in Costa Rica and in Ghana and my students are doing this really cool environmental education program in Costa Rica in April. My alumni is in your class, Jenny Collins, she couldn't be more excited about your project. These are all great things. How do we share that with others, and how do I learn more from others? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's this, was, this was the beginning of an attempt. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think that's great, but there's got to be some institutional and structural ways to uh, get a little more information out. Um, I guess taught to a first year class last semester, and none of them had done Emily's fantastic tour or were familiar with any of the sustainability efforts on campus. I personally think as part of orientation week for first year students, that the tour should be required. Um, and when I started talking about it in the they were like, oh, cool, bees, where do I find? I mean, it was really exciting to them. And none of them were in the environmental sciences. So, anyway, yeah. That's my feeling. Thank you. The daily question that I ask myself. Yeah. And I'd love to be a part of that if there was a way to. In fact, I mean, I think the, the, the sustainability webpage does a great job of doing that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always wary of trying to create some infrastructure to make this happen because there's so many infrastructures to get information out that it, it, everybody ignores it now. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's probably more productive for people like us to talk to other people, engage in cross uh, school classes. So perhaps reaching out to Simon or, or Chris to, to incorporate those two different classes mm -hmm. together and coming up with synergistic projects, um, that's one way to do it. The uh, sponsoring of undergraduate scholarship winners, for example, the UDRAW scholarship <coughs> program is a great way to sort of advertise student achievements in the area. I think AU is second in the nation for UDRAW scholars. And, and, and a number of those students have come through the programs that we've been talking about. And so, you know, there, there are lots of little pieces and it would be great to pull them all together at the university level, but I think uh, it's just unmanageable that way, and the, the portal that you all have set up has been very, very useful, I think, as one of those things. There was also, uh, this morning, I don't know if anyone went to it, there was a conversation, I'm not sure if the provost was, was part of the conversation, but he sent an email around a couple days ago, I think everyone was going to the conference, about uh, a discussion about general education requirements, and he was proposing some um, themes for how to some principles for what general education should include. Sustainability was not one of them. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that um, we have proposed that it be, um, and that was not accepted. So um, you know, that partly is an answer to your question of how can we institutionalize this in a way that at least, you know, the, the, the general proposal from our point of view was how can we make sure that every student who leaves AU has a, 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 grip, a, a grip on the fundamentals of sustainability. They need to know what climate change is. Um, they need to know the, some of the terms and concepts 
that will affect them no matter what their career is and, and no matter where they live. Um, so we've been informally conducting a sort of a literacy assessment of our own. Now, there's not currently a national standard for sustainability and literacy, but there's one in development actually, and if you want to be involved in that process, I can connect you with the group that's um, developing this national standard for a literacy assessment. Okay, great. Oh, and yeah, so this is an example of um, some literacy assessments uh, from other schools. Um, is is ours one there? Uh, I see the one from University of Maryland and one from Ohio State. But you know, we can get that would be you know, one area that if that people are interested, I'd be happy to invite you to join a group of faculty to discuss refining um, the sustainability literacy assessment that we do and working to get it institutionalized rather than just being kind of an informal project. Other questions, comments, project ideas? Uh, yeah, I still take the position of the outsider. Uh, uh, obviously, I don't know what you're talking about, but I, I, I found this, I'll use the word, very narrow. Uh, and in other words, I'm trying to understand how this fits elsewhere on other things, rather than it's just people interested in sustainability talking to themselves. I mean, you, you raised this issue. How, how can you expand it? Uh, I don't know enough about the subject yet, but uh, I, I have a feeling uh, I've seen people down at various demonstrations on fracking or whatever else it is, uh, having the narrowest point of view on where, whatever the subject is, and the rest of us in government or whatever have no idea what they're talking about. And so, uh, and if you're trying to impact on students for their future life, uh, while you want to inform them about sustainability, which I still don't understand, then uh, they've got to understand the pluses and the minuses on, on what are you doing, not just to be, you know, down with this, you know, or up with that. And you're teaching, I, you mentioned, you're teaching a practicum program right now? Yeah. I am too, uh, but in the future, one of the things, uh, AID, I mentioned, has um, a climate change program, and one of the things, listening to you, that I would like to get for the next practical is a number of students from your group going over to AID as the client to try to resolve, help resolve, real world problems, which are climate change that they're supposed to be working on. Maybe they can get some advantage or learn something from from, from the work you know, you're doing. Okay. So uh, since you, you you've asked again, I'll I'll try to give um, one answer that could help frame the scope of the discussion when we use the terms when I use the term sustainability. One of the more broadly accepted, um, and I'll invite all of my colleagues to disagree, um, but one of the more accepted. Um, definitions of sustainability, and I'm paraphrasing that this was from, this was developed at Rio, the, basically something that allows future generations to live the way we do, so that so that the quality of life for um, future humans isn't worse than it is for us today. Mm -hmm. Someone else could probably quote it more for No, me. that's, that's not my yeah. That's right. like 1988. So sustainability is a value. You were earlier asking, what's climate environment sustainability? I mean, sustainability, if that's a value, I mean, climate isn't really a value, neither really, environment is a concept. Um, it's interesting in intellectual discussion that discourse really and how we talk about it really matters a lot. But I think the field of sustainability, if you really look at it, it does seem very narrow are focused on political discourse of today. But if you think about the fact that it really encompasses things like classical political philosophy, ethics, um, you know, I mean, you look at Aristotle, and you read Aristotle, and he's talking about the same thing that modern sustainability thinkers talk about in terms of what's the best life, you know, what is the good what is that composed of? 
that's this this question that this value system that really uh, this field of sustainability is trying to work in. But it's just it's in its it's in its infancy. I mean, this is what 30 years old. This concept, what when came out, out in the VA. I mean, it's all a reaction to the fact that people woke up in the late 80s and said to a series of climate events that were happening in the Western world, not even in developing countries, they said, oh my God, there's flooding in Europe, why? Scientists, British scientists looked at it, they started writing, and they said, okay, suddenly the word climate starts appearing in British scientific journals in the late 80s. And the term global warming, which I think had been first used in the 50s, they started to bring it back in. So it's this real recent discourse and I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with it. And I think the part of the thing that I think we have to understand about also is there's a generational shift coming where everyone my age and educated in university, I mean, it really wasn't about getting a job. It's more about the play of ideas. And so you don't want any of this fashionable stuff. You don't want these trends. They're going to go away. You want the classic stuff. So it's kind of like, no, we're dismissive of this. In a way, I think that's part of what the blockage is at this higher level. I think if we fast forward 20 years and we're still in this, you know, you know, horror show, um, I think people that are going to be leaving universities, like you know, I don't know, people sitting in this room, or you know, it's going to be different. Well, okay, I, I'll, my last comment, uh, in, in international development that I'm working on, mm -hmm. uh, one of the sub 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 is, is agriculture. Yeah. Now, as, uh, as um, population increases, you can't do things the way you, you used to do it before. You have to make change. You have to come up with new ideas, new technology to improve agricultural production, you have to do infrastructure or whatever else, you have to have a new green revolution. So um, I'm not sure that sustainability, I mean, sustainability in this case is not to do agriculture the way they used to do. Maybe the one sustainable element is each person should, should get you know, the right amount of food. That's the sustainable level. And then everything else has, may have to change in order to, to achieve that. So uh, you've, you've the word sustainability bothers me. You've just articulated the perfect classroom exercise. Mm -hmm. So you come into your class and you say USAID and foreign aid is you know Obama's food security plans and all of that for the future. Um, and you say, how are we gonna do that? And then you list four or five challenges for them, give them four or five readings and let them talk about it. Mm -hmm. And your students will thrive if you give them that question. There's not necessarily an answer if we had one you know, we would have fixed it. Um, but that's the perfect exercise. It's a similar to one that I do. Um, and your kids will love it. And I promise, they, they just, they really love to talk about world what issues. Yeah, and if you want a practical exercise, you can tie it to food provisioning on our campus, or you can tie it to um, food deserts in Southeast Washington, DC. You know, so you can say these international development challenges that are affecting people in distant places are present in our local Washington, DC community. Let's get a task force of students together and go out there and, and measure distance from supermarkets and so forth. That's kind of basic work of food provisioning in our, in our nation's capital. Um, and then students suddenly understand these abstract notions like food provisioning in a very concrete way. So you can take this idea of treating the campus and the city as laboratory and you can apply it far beyond environmental concerns, like human rights, social justice, international conflict and so forth. All of these things, you read about them uh, but we have expression of them right on our campus and the students get their hands dirty by working on real problems, they start to understand them in better ways. I take my students to the DC Central Kitchen right before we do Feed the Future and that debate. And I'd be happy to give you that contact if you'd like. And then they volunteer, they have to cut carrots or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. You asked about uh, project ideas. I, I have this project idea that's been in my head for quite a while, and I don't know whether this is an appropriate form to sort of ask about it or not. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sound probably somewhat ridiculous to, to some people, but uh, you just mentioned sort of using DC as a testing ground. Um, I don't know how many schools there are in DC, not universities, but like elementary schools, middle schools, you know, hundreds, right? 
Um, every time there's a child's birthday, there are 30 kids from their class who are invited. And they all attend this birthday party, and they all bring some $12 toy made in China. And each child then goes home with 30 toys that are either going to get thrown away at some point, maybe recycled, maybe not. Um, and it's, it's just, it, it's a cyclical thing that, you know, people are just giving, you know, spending money on crap, and which is all necessarily bad for the environment. My idea is that, the, that to create some central place, a, a website, where rather than every child giving every child in their class a birthday present, times 30, so you get, you know, whatever that number is of students in the class times the number of birthday parties times the number of schools in DC. Um, maybe the kid gets, you know, for their birthday a, a, a t-shirt with the recycling symbol um, and the rest of the money gets donated to, uh, you know, a sustainability cause. Maybe they get one toy that's, that's made in the United States from recycled material the rest of the money gets donated. Um, and again, I preface it by saying it sounds a little bit silly, but I think starting out as a, in a testing ground like DC, um, and I think the potential for you know expanding it nationwide is probably pretty great. And uh, if there were a little bit of money and someone who had some computer savvy, uh, I would love to try to lead that effort. Okay, great. Well, uh, and not only does it not sound crazy, but I'll give an analogy of something we've actually done on campus that I think is pretty similar. If you think of another event where everybody buys something cheap and disposable, um, it's Halloween. You have to buy mm -hmm. costumes. And so on campus the last two years, um, three years, we, we, we work with a group of students that are called Green Eagles. Um, this is an outside the classroom group of students that we train throughout the year on sustainability topics and then serve as peer educators. And uh, so what we do is organize them to have a Halloween gift uh, costume exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so we put tables on the quad and people bring their old costumes and they can come and pick up free ones. So not crazy and we'd be happy to look at ways that we might be able to test it in the class. Yeah, what, a, what a cool thing to run by your students. Yeah. You, know, you identify this really discrete problem and you say, here's one way to think about it and tackle it. Mm -hmm. um, what else would you do? So it really does, it does have these larger implications because if you're getting them while they're young and you're right. sort of breaking that sort of value of, yeah. oh, let's consume. And, and you know, one of the things that's, that I think is important for us from the instructor's uh, point of view is that we don't have to have the answers, and it's okay to go into a problem not, defined, not, not having the end goal defined. And, and again, it's about managing the expectations. You let them know, I don't know what the answer is, and the goal of this class is to figure out what possibilities are out there. I'm here to guide you, uh, but you are in charge of finding out what the opportunities are. And well, not be afraid of doing that. You across the street, you know? You walk across there yeah. and you say, you get the students involved in talking with teachers. Can we do this? Would it be possible? Yeah. And they find out that no, it's not possible because nobody's going to support it. Well, how do we overcome that? And it's just an incredible opportunity for learning for your students, even if it goes nowhere. And we do have contacts at the school across the street. What school across the street? Jane. Horseman. Yeah. Okay. Also contacts Jane. Yeah. 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 And, and we'll say, yeah. We have contacts. Is there someone from the sustainability office that might be interested in trying to work? On this sure. Period? Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to have a conversation. Um, I'll give you my card. Just a, a quick suggestion. Um, the zoo does an enormous number of birthday parties, and they would be a perfect target audience for your students to hide that. Because people who take their kids to the zoo are already seeing it. Perfect. It's in the fall. Are you still going to be the director when you start teaching full time? Yeah. Okay. Other comments or ideas? Thanks. 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 Thanks.